How did we do this last time? I think you looked at the camera. Hey, everybody. Matthew Olmekin here for the Hornet Test, but more specifically right here uh, with On Focus with Steve... <laughs> Akinek. Akinek. <laughs> Steve-o. <laughs> and we were here last time. We had a full bracket breakdown, but now we're actually in level three play, correct? Yep. And wouldn't you know it, Steve's like, Matt, my schedule is free. Is that, is that room of yours available? I'm like, come on down. So here we are at it again to talk about level three play, but not just in our specific group, but we're actually going to expand it to all four groups. All four groups. Yep. All four games, all eight teams that are left in D6. Well, fantastic. Well, you know, leading up to this point, it's been fantastic football. We've had upsets, not just in this division, but other divisions, and um, exciting gameplay, but you know, there's also been your blowouts, but also, you know, talking as a homer, Colby has been doing extremely well. Colby's had a good start to the year, uh, to the playoffs, obviously two very big wins. Um, we've had some interesting games come up though. Some interesting scores come across. Um, obviously even in, we'll get to it in a moment, but the team that Colby's playing this week has had a bit of a Cinderella run here. <laughs> see now, did you see how I did that? That, and that leads up to the, the, we'll just jump right into it. The first game you want to highlight, um, Auburndale at Colby. So there's that element of here we have an upset team, like your Cinderella team, that's steamrolling over people as a sixth seed. And then you've got uh, the number one seed at Colby Hornets, who seem to be sitting in the driver's seat. But here comes Auburndale. You know, obviously they played week nine. Colby got the best of them then, but... We've seen two very different Auburndale teams in the playoffs so far. Level one, they go to Nasita and they get themselves into a shootout. They win 63-36. Next week, completely different personality. They beat Marquezan in a good old-fashioned slobber knocker, 19-9. Yeah. Uh, th uh, when somebody told me the score, I'm like, is that first quarter? They're like, no, that's final. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, Auburndale played two very, very different games already in the playoffs. Um, I mean, but they've they were underseeded. They were blatantly underseeded. That's a hot take. As a six seed, um, you know their their resume wasn't that bad as compared to some of the other teams. Resume from like their full season. Yeah. What do you mean from their season? Like when you look at their se their regular season. I mean, they were seven and three. Um, there all three of their losses were to playoff teams. Two of their losses were to very good playoff teams. And Colby and Edgar. Colby. Um, I think they kind of got punished a little bit being that third team in a five-team conference. That was really what it ended up being this year. Um, and their non-conference wasn't the greatest, so I think that hurt them a little bit too. But in the end, I mean, you got to win the games on the field. And I was going to say, like, you know, it, it stinks being a road team. But like you said, it comes down to just being a team in front of you no matter where the game is being played. And I think it probably helped them a little bit, kind of takes the nerves off of playing at home where they got to just go, you know, get on the bus, clear their heads, get down to their game, play hard, win. I never thought of that. That's a really good point. Um, but yeah, definitely it's a different Auburndale team than we saw towards the end of the regular season. I mean, you know, week eight, they've got that kind of rough one against Marathon, maybe looking ahead to the Colby game. Mm -hmm. Week nine, Colby kind of really has their way with them. I think that was a 40 some point win there for it was like 54 to oh, I forget now. I think it was like there's 50, a large margin of victory. It was like 54 7 or 54 14, yes. something like that. But I mean, obviously Colby still, I mean, they really haven't been tested all that much here in the playoffs. You know, I mean, Okano was a pretty easy win. Abbotsford put up a little bit more of a fight, but I mean, they were Colby's just had outmatched on both I'll match their opponents on both levels. It'll be interesting to see what Auburndale brings. So I got a fun factoid for you from that Kobe Abbotsford game. Not to get too sidetracked. Mm -hmm. Um so yeah the margin of victory against Abbotsford it was substantial, yep. right? But did you know that Abbotsford put up more rushing yards against Colby than any other team during the season? And that includes Edgar and Hortonville. Yep. Isn't that something? Yeah you know, we talked um it was in the pregame show but we talked to coach Nat Miller on Wednesday or Thursday, and he brought that up that um, they've done that all year. They've been able to put yards up. It's one of their best gaining teams they've ever had, but they just can't quite find the end zone. And that's what kind of like the t like not to get too sidetracked, but like that was kind of like the hallmark of that. But and then 
that was the first game in, I think it was like two or three games, if I look back, that Colby had to punt yeah. more than twice. That's just insane. I know, but but still, like you, you know, you look at the final score, and it was like forty-eight to eight. And I mean, you talk about that a little bit, but you look at Colby, and I and we'll see it more as we look at some of the other teams. The stats don't jump off the like the offensive stats don't for jump Colby off the screen at you because they're they're not getting the field to rack up yards. Like you know, they only gain two hundred nine yards a game on the ground. Mm-hmm. You know, there's some teams we'll see that are gaining three three hundred three fifty. You know, and then that's the other thing is is like not to jump in. Um, we do not have a, a leading individual in the Merrowood yep. Conference. Like, no leading passer, no leading rusher. Because, um, like, you look at it, like, there's there's kind of like a balance. Like, yeah, you have Jeske and, and on down the line, everybody's got their triple mm-hmm. digits. But you don't have one outstanding mainstay player. And if you think about it, majority of the games, they're the starters are playing half games. Yep. So that's the one dumbfounding thing is, like, the one thing that we have a huge mark on is not just – what we have for overall touchdowns for rushing, but we're top 10 in the state in sacks. Yep. And those were based on half or like, um, these starters playing half of the time. And some of those games were run the clock. Yeah. And that's also affecting the yardage. Cause if you're not giving anything exactly up, and they're mm-hmm. punting from their own 20, their own 25 their Colby just doesn't have the amount of field to gather up large amounts of yards. Mm-hmm. So you're not going to, you know, you're going to put, you know, they're averaging 42 points a game, but they're just not putting the yards together because they're starting their drives a lot of times in opponent territory. Yes. So then, okay, fine. Instead of maybe getting the 80 yards rushing on a, on a drive, you're getting 45. Mm-hmm. So I think that's one where just pure stat looking, I think Colby doesn't look as strong offensively as they are because they just haven't had opportunities to really rack up the yards and stuff like that. But point wise, I mean, if you got if you're a high school football team and you're averaging 42 and a half points a game, I think you're doing pretty well. So, where are the things that Colby should watch out for this Auburn Dale game? So, like I've been saying the whole week of like you know, when er, everybody was like really excited once I announced what the Auburn Dale score was and everybody found out that Auburn Dale was going to be coming to Colby like, "Oh, you know, we steamrolled these guys before. This will be great." But you said that before, like you don't know what Auburndale team you're going to get. They still have a lot of dynamic athletes, especially with Weber, because like mm-hmm. leading rusher, leading passer. And then, um, how do you say his last name? Robson? Roberson. Roberson. You know, that kid's, uh, he's a he's a spark in the flash pan or however that saying goes, but like he's got a motor on him too. So can you see where Auburndale could pose a huge issue to Colby if especially if they start doing an offense where they flank away from our like our front seven? I think you could see it if if they can get a bit of that passing game going, a lot of that quick hit passing. I had the chance to see it when they played Pittsville. They did a lot of like short screens, kind of take the defensive line out of the game, out of the picture. You know, where you start getting in trouble is when you try and drop back, you know, that five, six step drop, let a play develop. I could see Weber snap, go throw. That might be the thing that beats Colby. Now, the question is can they consistently execute that against even the Col- against the Colby secondary? One that hasn't been tested that much within the Marowood because there isn't really that many teams that can throw the ball that well. But man, are they making gains though? Because the interceptions yep. all of a sudden started really going up. Yep, and and that might be what it is. It's going to be a kid that jumps a route, a kid that you know times a hit perfectly, not knocks the ball loose. That might be all it takes. Hmm. But and obviously, at, um, Auburndale's been very good defensively throughout the season. So I mean, they if they can key something up find something that they can attack on. Maybe they can slow Colby down a little bit and make it close. But And then a close game in the playoffs, you never know what can happen in the end. That's true. So, But your feeling is, is that if Colby brings their A game... If Colby brings their A game, they should win. Mm-hmm. But I wouldn't put it past this Auburndale team to come out and come out early, punch Colby in the mouth a little bit, and kind of... Which they did in that first game, too. And everybody got quiet. (laughs) And if it gets quiet, all of a sudden that plays in Auburndale's favor. If they get an early touchdown, they get some confidence. And then maybe they forget about, you know, 
three weeks ago mm-hmm. and they start getting that confidence going and then you then who knows so it, sh- it should be an electrifying game should be an electrifying game so anything else you want to mention on that one? I think I'm good on that one. So this is uh, the reason I'm really glad you're here is because all these other teams, especially this next one, um, Unity is going to be taking on Durand at Durand. Yep. And I really don't know much about these, you know, save for a few games where you see like the stats, you know, because I know that they got a an, an all-star running back. They do. Um, Durand... We talked about them a little bit two weeks ago, but going a little more, they they have one loss on the year, and that was in Eau Claire to Eau Claire Regis. And they only lost to Eau Claire Regis by 10. The closest game Eau Claire Regis Tough had team. all year. Tough team. Um, it's a running team. For Hornet fans, think Spencer, but with some option. Mm. So it's, it's a lot Gave of me the that, shivers. <laughs> it's a lot of the similar type of motions and stuff, and then throw in a little bit of Medford, with, just big dudes with the big dudes and the snap to the running back and just run into the line and run people over. Oh, I Chihuahua. So, with with all that being said, is this going to be something where Unity can come up to the challenge against a team like this? Then it's hard to say. Um, the hard part, so I mean... Because they only have one loss overall, huh? Or yeah. two? No, one overall. One overall. Um, they were 6-1 and one in conference. Their only conference loss was to Hurley, who's a one seed in Division 7. Hurley's, yeah, a baller who's legit, Who took Edgar out and beat him pretty soundly twice. Yeah. Scoreboard didn't, rec- didn't you know, show that, but they beat him. They dominated both those games, just couldn't punch it into the end zone. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but I mean, I just don't see how it I don't see how Unity stops Simon Bauer. I mean, the guy's three yards short of a 2,500-yard season. I was just about to say, like, he's got as many touchdowns himself as uh, some teams in the Merrowood have, or yep. even, I would even say, in the Clover Belt. Yep, very much so. Um, yet, you know, 2,497 yards in 11 games. <laughs> I mean, oh. he's averaging over 200 yards a game. That's unbelievable. Um, but yeah, I mean, and then, oh, so he doesn't have the ball. You got that Dawson Hart, Hardung, 117 carries. Hardung. Harding. Harding? Hardung. Hardung. I'm, okay. I'm guessing Hardung. We'll Mr. Harding. H. Mr. H. 117 <laughs> carries, 868 yards and 13 touchdowns. See, now himself. that's solid carrying. That's like, that's like, you know, not to compare it to Colby people, but that's like Caden Healy yep. numbers. You don't get many carries, but every time he touches the ball, he makes something happen. Yep. And a lot of that is similar to Colby, you know, all right, snap comes to Bauer. He hands, he, you know, they fake the handoff a few times, then he gives it to him. Everybody's going to bite on Bauer and boom. So are these guys wildcat formation um, or do they have a passing game? A little bit of a passing game. They have a quarterback, but he hasn't, I mean, 48 of 84 for 600 yards, 650 yards. Mm. So not much of one. It's, um, it's very much like the little bits I've kind of jumped around a little bit in their game against Nilesville. Um, they kind of switch up between the Spencer set with the two wings and the fullback and a quarterback, and then they'll take the quarterback out and they'll go the Medford two running backs snap can go either way. They'll hand out of it. They'll option out of it. I mean, there's a ton of stuff going on there, but the snaps going directly to Bauer. That sounds like a defensive nightmare. Yes. But in the end, it's a lot of the plays, after all the misdirection, is Bauer student body left or Bauer student body right. I gotcha. So in the, there's a lot of misdirection there, but in the end, the plays are simple. Once, once all the misdirection's over, the play is simple. It's everybody blocking for Bauer going one direction, either side of the line. So it's all about like if you can, do, if you can dominate the front line, front you can line. dominate that offense, which sounds like Unity is going to have – they're hands full because, like, yeah, you look at um, – so who's their big bad carrier here? So you, they, got, they got the whole team together, just a little over 2,000 yards rushing, 25 um, touchdowns on the season with – it looks like with uh, Brody and Tristan. Yep. Solid solid running numbers. So, like, you see, like, low carrying numbers with, like, high, uh, with high yardage. But, like, yeah, it's nowhere near, like, what it, you see yeah, with the other no, guy. Not at all. And, you know, it's a lot also of comparing conferences. I mean, the Clover Belt, 
you know, obviously with Eau Claire Regis, Mondovi has been very good in that new reform. It's a stack conference. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's a stack conference and they had just the one loss. Plus they took out spring Valley, who was the champion of the Dun St. Croix week one, you know, so, I mean, they beat four playoff teams, including it, including a couple two seeds. Mm. Um, so they had a really tough schedule. I would say that their schedule, Duran's schedule, would be comparable to Colby's. Interesting. Um, Unity, on the other hand, the Lakeland, you don't want to disparage a conference, but the Lakeland is very nope, top Nope, go heavy. ahead and say it. <laughs> Lakeland's very top heavy. Hurley, <laughs> Brandsburg, Unity, all very good, but the bottom of that conference, you know, Rib Lake Prentice was three and four in the Lakeland this year. Um, Webster was three and four. And a lot of that was, there was a couple forfeits in there, kind of like the Merrowood. Um, but they're, you know, they beat two sevens and an eight seed in the playoffs. Yeah. Those are their play against playoff field wins. And they got absolutely run over by Hurley. I was to say, I just, I noticed that on your, your notes here that their loss, uh, came to by Hurley. Hurley 42 to six. And that's a team that Edgar, twice kept it within a score mm. so, so unity's got quite the hill to climb quite the hill to climb but you know they and they lucked out you know obviously with grantsburg beating um augusta who was a pretty good team yeah but again you know maybe a little misleading coming out of a weaker conference they got to host a level two home game instead of having to go on the road i think that helped them a little bit sure but i mean durand is a whole different beast Whew. And a beast that uh, looks like they will probably be carrying on to level four. I have, huh? a, I have a feeling that it'll. I have a feeling that if you told me I had to, if you held a gun to my head and told me I had to pick a team out of that one, I mean Duran for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I well, don't. You can hold anything to your head. <laughs> at level three, I don't want to pick because you know because it's all good teams at this level. Mm. But Duran is just a level above. Yeah. You know, and I mean, you look at it. So every when everyone celebrated Regis going to D seven. And you're looking, you're like, well, we still have Durand. Well, Durand was probably happy that Regis left too, Dur huh? Because I mean, this would be this would this today or this Friday would be Durand at Eau Claire Regis if Regis had stayed. Up How about six. that? I mean, that would have, and then you'd have Colby, Colby or Auburndale at Regis versus Regis. I Chihuahua. So yeah, that is a brutal. That would have been brutal if Regis would have stayed up. Yeah, for sure. So that brings us to, we're done on the left side of the bracket. Yep. So then if we were going to jump over to the other side, now this is getting into the realm where some people are probably learning some of these cities and towns for the first time. So you have Cuba City at Darlington. So you have, um, wow, is this right? So you have a team that was um, has one loss on the season and the other one has two losses on the season. Yep. And comparable, kind of looks like comparable stats if I'm not looking at, this correctly, but what do you see in this matchup then? Um, starting with Darlington, ten and one, seven and zero. Oh. Um, their only, you know, they their only loss was to St. Mary Springs, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Yeah, but you look at it; they beat. I don't remember do the counting here because I forgot to put it on the stats. They beat six playoff teams out of their nine games. That this is this games. is Darlington. Darlington. Wow. They won at Platteville. They played two playoff teams in non-conference. So overall, out of their nine games, they played seven playoff teams. So these guys are battle-tested. Battle-tested. Um, they've been there. They're definitely in the been there, done that. They lost a couple state. They've been in the state title game um, in 17, 15, and 14. Wow. So a team, and they lost all three of those to St. Mary Springs. Oh, all, every single one every to the same one team? St. Mary Springs. Oh, yeah, Chihuahua. But, you know, they've done good work there. Um, run heavy team. Um, they don't, they throw the ball a little bit, but I mean, really a bounce running attack. Um, they're, again, the one team that would score as much as Colby does 44 points a game. I was going to say, though, like, you know, it doesn't pass a lot, but it looks like this guy, uh, Braden Davis. Pretty productive. Pretty productive. Just a little, just a little round, like 50% of his passes completed, just shy under 700 yards. Um, eight touchdowns, but it looks like he also can run the ball, and he scored 12 touchdowns, so that's run like a... 12. Yeah. Then you've got Easton Evans, Evanstead, 
896 yards, 15 touchdowns. Wow, only on like just a little over 100, 100 carries. carries. Yeah. Wow. And then, oh boy, you get past those two. Then you got a guy, Braylon Gable, Gable, 103 carries for 750 yards and 10 touchdowns. So what kind of do, what kind of offense is this? Like a traditional like shotgun I, formation, I one running back? I a lot of good video on them, so I'm not 100% sure. Oh, how exciting. <laughs> from what I could see, I'm guessing from something like that, it's probably going to be... Looking at the stats, it's going to be some type of like Spencer-ish kind of okay, where the ball's going a lot of different directions, and you know you've got you know the fullback, the two wings, or something like that. Does nobody run like a like a mom and pop bread and butter? Oh, we're getting to them. Oh, okay. Oh yeah, we're getting to them. <laughs> okay. In fact, Cuba City is probably Cuba City is one of an actual bounced football team in high school, which is not something you see too often. Sure. They've thrown for 1,900 yards and run for 1,600 yards. That's not easy to do. It's no. not easy to pass over 800 yards in a season. No, and they've done 1,900. <laughs> 24 touchdowns each way. Wow. Um, Bo Cop, you know, 1,928 yards passing, 24 touchdowns. Also run for almost 400 yards. Man, what an touchdowns. athlete. So he's got 36 touchdowns by himself. Yes. Wow. You know, and they're scoring, you know, they've scored 36 points a game. Um, don't give up much either. I mean, they're only giving up 18. Darlington beat Cuba City 53-33 in the regular season. Wow. They both play in the, the Southwest Athletic League, the SWAL. So now, what do you think going into this game? Do you think Cuba City could say like, hey, we're going to exploit this with the passing game? I, honestly, I think it comes down a bit to weather. Because if you're a passing team and you're going to get into late cold. season football and it shouldn't be cold, it's going to be in the 50s, but depending on wind and everything like that could have an effect. But I mean, really, honestly, I think Darlington is just... I, mean, I was to say in your notes, you, you list them as a three-headed monster with a running attack. Yeah. I mean, that is going to be... You're going to keep teams off the field and you're going to you know run and run and run and do that kind of stuff. And it's just going to slow, you know, if teams just can't, wear get them back down. Out, can't get back out on the field to throw the ball, it's not worth it. That makes sense. Um, and also Darlington has just always had a good program. And I mean, really, I would say they may have played the toughest schedule in high school football this, in low level high school football, low Whoa. volume, low division high school football this year. Interesting. I mean, if you can play seven playoff teams in nine games, that's... I was going to say, that's, in, that's impressive. That's impressive. Absolutely. Um, so... Was oh, it? You know, and it's one of those also, though, where most of those teams played each other in the regular season in that grouping. I mean, you look at it Darlington, Benton Scales, Scales Mound, Schulzburg, Cuba City, Lancaster, all, you know, all those teams are all in that swall down in that southwestern part of the state. And they all got in that cluster right there. They all How got about, in that same cluster. Yeah. So they're like, oh, it's just like a regular season now, yep. <laughs> but we're playing postseason. And you know, we talked about the Clover Belt with Durand, Mondovi, one of the other really good teams from the Clover Belt. Um, Darlington beat them on Saturday, level two, pretty mm. soundly. So, mm -hmm. um, but no, I mean Darlington, they've that's one of those towns that, and you when you get to the state level for teams around here, you they always just seem to be there. Yeah, you know they're perennial uh, contenders. Perennial contenders. They're like an Edgar or Stratford that are just always around that level three, level four state area. And even in the years when they're down, it's they might go out in a level three or a level four game, but very rarely do they go out before that. So it's kind of like that classic Wisconsin grid nose kind yep. of football town. Oh yeah, and that southwestern part of the state is known for those kind of football towns. You know, the for Darlington. Sure. Cuba City the same way. They pass a little more now, but that's still uh, right down there on the border with Illinois. They they play some different football down there. Yeah, absolutely. So speaking of like uh, some more exciting football, here's here's your next cluster. So this would be the two that survived uh, the, D, the D group. You have St. Mary Springs. That's Everybody's heard of that yep. team. But then you got Kenosha St. Kenosha St. Joseph Catholic. Yep. Two Catholic schools facing off. Um, Man, what a ball game that would be, huh? Oh. <laughs> I mean, Kenosha St. Joseph, the only undefeated team left in D6. 
Real? Oh, I didn't They're, even notice that. Yep, yeah, absolutely. 11-0, 7-0 in the Metro Classic. Um, but, and honestly, I, we talked about the bounce from Cuba City. How about this? They've thrown for 1,441 yards, mm. ran for 1,465 yards. When's the last time you've seen something like that? In high school football, never. Oh, that was a, but like the same amount of yards same for passing yard. and rushing. Yeah. yeah, I mean, in high school football, it's insane. Even at the pro level, usually you're lean a little way one or an, one or the other. Absolutely, but they've been able to do it completely level. Um, maybe a little bit of a weaker schedule compared to um, some of the other teams here. The Metro Classic, not necessarily putting teams in the playoffs. They were able to avoid one of the other good teams in their conference due to a COVID shutdown mm. for the other team. Um, they've only, they only beat three, they only beat three playoff teams all year. The Kenosha. Kenosha. They won at Catholic central. They won at home to Brookfield Academy. And then they lost at Racine Lutheran. That's always a good football town. It's a good football town. It's a good football team. Racine Lutheran, right? Yeah. Yep. Uh, Racine Lutheran won a state championship a couple of years ago. They were probably the second best team in that conference. Mm -hmm. They're out. They they went out level two. Catholic Central, I believe, is no. They went out level two as well. They lost to Reedsville in D seven, and I can't remember where Brook, Brookfield Academy. I'm pretty sure is out too. They didn't lose to any non playoff teams. Oh, I gotta change this over quick. Uh, they didn't lose to any non playoff teams. But they also really didn't beat anybody all that impressive this year. So how do you look at those numbers then? I mean, that's still an astounding and, number. And or there's like still an astounding number. They're still putting up um, amazing yards, amazing numbers. But you start to question it a little bit. Of all right, you know, it's easy to put it's easy to put numbers up if you're not if you're playing slightly weaker opponents. Mm -hmm. um, and that that would be the that would be my big question. There is. Have they really played a team that has tested them the way that St. Mary Springs is? Um, well, that would be fair. Yep. Which brings that to St. Mary Springs. Like that's, like I said, everybody's heard of this team. They got quite the resume, and it looks like they got uh, one loss in the conference, but two overall. Two overall. And I'm just kind of scrolling down here. I'm going to pretend I'm Steve and list off a bunch of stuff. So you saw they had wins, like I said, against. A strong Darlington team. Mm -hmm. And then you also list Alan Campbell Sport, Winnebago, um, and Mayville yep. on there. And then Ozaki. Yep. Right? So, yep. So those are all the playoff teams they beat. So that's a lot of them. A lot of them. Campbell Sport still alive. They're a one, they're a two seed in D5. Mayville had a really good season, came up, kind of came up short. Um, Ozaki, the team in the conference that kind of snuck into the playoffs in that mm -hmm. three and four spot. But um, you know, that big win beating Darlington in Darlington week two going cross state um, and beating a very good Darlington team. I mean, it was a tough conference for them this, this year. Um, you know, that flyway is always difficult, but since they restructured it, it's gotten a lot harder for them. But I mean, the level of competition or how far they got to travel level of competition. I gotcha. You know, they used to get to play a few, lot more D seven schools. And now it's more a D5, D6 instead of D6, D7 conference. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, you want to talk about a team that's been battle tested, though. You know, if we delete out the 2020 season, because there's no state tournament, no true state tournament, they've won state championships in five of the last six full seasons. That's insane. And they did it four in D6, and mm -hmm. they did one in D5 in 2018 when they beat Stratford. I was going to say, because I thought they beat Stratford, and, yep. I, and I, that was in D5. St. Mary Springs rides that line between Division 5 and Division 6, mm. similar to kind of where Eau Claire Regis was this year between 6 and 7. Yeah. They jump back and forth between 5 and 6. Well, Colby had that one that was like 2018. Yep. They tread that line, and then we got bumped to 5. Mm -hmm. So St. Mary Springs that year went up to 5. Mm -hmm. Um beat Stratford in a state championship game. They beat, they've beaten Darlington a few times in state championship games, but really, I mean, they, they were the team that took out Eau Claire Regis in 2019. I was going to say, I remember that game, the seven, the six, nothing. Se se oh, it was, I was going to say seven, two, but like, yeah, six, nothing, six, nothing, just an absolute defensive game. Coach Highland, their head coach is the winningest coach in the history of Wisconsin football. 
high school football. So are these, so how would you compare like, so offensive style is St. Mary's run an offense that's similar, like a Regis style offense, you know, like they, bunch formation. You don't know where the heck that ball's going and not as much there. No, they changed. I, I, one credit I will give to the coaching staff there. They change what they, what they do based on the talent they have around them. Mm. So they're not taking, they're not doing the square peg in the round hole. They're, making a square hole to put that peg in based on the talent they have around them. Uh, a couple of years ago, they were a heavy passing team. They had a six, seven wide receiver that ran like a four. Oh, you just throw the ball up. He'll go just throw the ball jump up and, up and he'll get catch it. it. Yeah. Now this year they were much more running. Um, you know, they ran for. Yeah. Almost like 2,800 yards 2, and 40 yards. touchdowns. Yeah. That's a big, that's a big mark. It is, but they still threw for, you know, 750 yards. Yeah. But you know, the, talent level it's moved more to the running game so i'm assuming that you know the coaching staff and hot bob highland make that decision to go all right we got running backs this year we don't have wide receivers we're gonna take our offense but we're gonna use the running plays more i got you a bit of a i wouldn't say pro style but closer to a pro style than what most of what colby's seen all year bit okay. more of a one or two wide receiver eye formation kind of stuff at least that's what they ran in the past i haven't seen them play it all this year Cause that's a big challenge with like, you know, if you look at like, cause Abbotsford and Regis run that style yep. offense where like, they're really tight and it's all about like, I have a big offensive line. I'm just going to pile drive you and then we can miss, and you can just move that ball wherever you want. But if you, do, and you said this before, if you don't have the personnel for that offense, you have one good defense, you just blow up the plays. Yep. You know what I mean? So that's interesting that you said that St. Mary Springs has just adapted their style over time. And that's not easy for a football program to do. No. I mean, they run the same basics, basic stuff. Everything's – all the basics are the same. It's just whether, whether – how much they run and how much they pass out of that. Mm -hmm. And that's where – that's what they've been so good at is they get so much out of the talent they have. And obviously being in Fond du Lac – and it's it's changed a bit now that the now that the public school is pretty good at football down there too. Beforehand, if it was kind of like Eau Claire, where if you were good at football, you went to St. Mary Springs, sure, because the public school, the two public schools, uh, North Fond du Lac and the actual Fond du Lac High School, and there's a Lutheran there too that were never any good. Mm -hmm. And then in the last about five six years, Fond du Lac's gotten really good, and I think it's actually probably hurt the St. Mary Springs program a little bit that some of that talent that would have to go and roll at St. Mary Springs to be on a good football team doesn't have to anymore. Mm -hmm. But, I um, mean, they still, I mean, you know, they're nine and two, six and one. Um, and I was going to say, it looks like they're really riding on the, on the arm of just of Cullen. Who's that's, that's around like a, like close to 50% of his passes that he's completed. Yep. But you know, for like on the rushing aspect, Nobody really has like all the rushing touchdowns. Well, I would say that well, Levi has like majority of them, yep. but like that's kind of like a similar Colby mark where it's like nobody really stands out. The ball's not going to one person. They're yeah. not there isn't anybody in that offense you can key up on. And, you know, I mean we talk about that, but then you look at the you know, bank going back to Kenosha St. Joseph, you know, they've got Two running I was going to say, like, it's a big laundry list. Everybody's got, like, Everybody's that's a big stat stuff. sheet. <laughs> and, in fact, on the receivers, I left the next guy off because I'm like, well, I have five players that we to talk about. The third receiver for them has eight cat eight touchdown catches as well. Wow. So it's, they're, you know, it's a team that is spreading it out. They are, you, they are loaded top to bottom on the roster. In terms of just raw talent, the question is, is that raw talent getting lots of stats because they're playing weaker teams or is that actual talent that is putting these kind of numbers up yeah and it's the hardest part when you look at these high school high school teams is who have they played yeah because that's then, the only gauge that you have only gauge you have and i would guess that saint mary springs just pure experience and pure awe factor of playing saint mary springs Mm -hmm. probably gets them through that. Interesting. But this is probably going to be the closest game out of all of them on Friday night. A number one and a number three. And that one's going to be a close call, but, and then you're kind of leaning that the number three is going to have an upset on the number one. I wouldn't be shocked if Kenosha St. Joseph comes out of this one, but I would put my money on St. Mary Springs. Ah, okay. Interesting. I, would, I think that's probably the only upset too, within all four of them. All so that the answer is my next question is like uh, my, I had uh, two questions. The question was like, who's going to be your upset game? And, and you said like, it would be yeah. that St. Mary's one. 
And which is of all these teams, which is which team is like kind of like a a scary team to play? Like if you're looking at this, you're like, God, I would not want to bring my football program to play those people. I would say Durand. Mm-hmm. I look at Durand and having watched, I actually got watched the most film on them. I would say that, I mean, that running back, um, Bauer, I mean, that's just... Insane you, numbers in an insane conference. That, yeah, in a hard conference and run for those kind of numbers, that's going to be a huge test. I think, um, you know, and then obviously it's not a one-man show there. If he was running, if he ran for 2,500 yards and the next guy ran for 200, I'd be concerned, but I'm going to make sure I get these, this information right here. But, you know, when... You know, the the second leading rusher has 868 yards and 13 touchdowns. I mean, it's not like you can just tell everybody in that defense, tackle him. Mm -hmm. You have to be, you have to be there and you have to be able to account for Harding. You have to be able to account for the quarterback. You have to be able to account for all the other pieces. So if you're going to beat this team, you got to have a very well disciplined defense, very well disciplined defense. And you have to. You have you almost have to play it like an option team. <laughs> where you go, all right, Brent and Andrew, you tackle Bauer. Um, Healy and um, Derek, you tackle mm-hmm. you tackle Harding. You two tackle this guy. Once you know where the ball is, tackle him. I was gonna say that was something that Colby did um, against Abbotsford for a majority of the time. Like, and I could tell. Like, I think Andrew Jeske had the assignment for JV Castillo. Like you said, like yep. you just go after that person. Yep. Go after that person. Go after that person and tackle them. I mean, that's really what it's going to come down to is you're going to, they're going to have to account for everyone. And that's the hardest part with a team like Durand. And honestly, it's the hardest part about a team like Colby. Yeah. You know, a lot of, te- a lot of people look at Colby and be like, all right, well, we have to stop it. We have to stop Brand Chesky. You can stop them. It's going to take, you're going to, you can put your defense and stop them, but Mason Voss, Caden Healy, they're just going to run all over you the other direction. Mm-hmm. And that's, they're very similar teams and not so much in the offenses they run, but in like the tight, the style they play. There is, you know, they both, you have a lot of people you have to account for. You can't key up on one individual and stop them. You know, there's a lot of weapons on both teams. So I think assuming the, both those uh, Colby and Duran get through, that is going to be one amazing game a week from Friday. So now here's a question. Um, do, do we know, like, let's say, like, just looking at any of the teams, like, everybody gets past level three to level four. Do, does everybody know where those level four games are going to be? I Looking at, um, on the Colby side of the bracket, I would guess Chippewa Falls, Doray Field and Chippewa Falls, just simply because it's a nice central location with all the larger school teams in this part of the state out. I mean, you don't have... Mm-hmm. Anybody, I mean, the only t- the only team left in eleven player football in Central Wisconsin is Colby. Mm. Everyone else is out. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, you've got a couple teams over there, but like D one, D two, D three, everybody's su- everybody's from the South or from the Fox Valley. So I don't think we'll see anything over there. And I honestly would guess it's going to be at Doray and Chippewa Falls. And that's like because like I think there was like a murmur like maybe Stanley Boyd or something like that. I could see Stanley Boyd as a backup if they have to have, if they get, you know, maybe Regis Hurley, but I'm guessing that would be in the Wausau area. Yeah. So, I mean, then you're looking D5. There's nobody from that half of the state in Division 5. Mm-hmm. Everybody in Division 5 is either lacrosse or, I mean, Amherst. Mm-hmm. But Amherst will be playing a team from the eastern part of the state, so they'll be playing somewhere along the Fox Valley. D7 is probably going to be Hurley Regis. That'll be Wausau Metro or maybe Marshfield. Oh, that would be super cool. Mike, I think they'll save Marshfield for maybe like a D4 game. Mm-hmm. Cause you'll get like Ellsworth, those teams against somebody from the, and Green why not? Area. It's a great facility, beautiful facility. So I would say if it's, if it's Durand, they might do Stanley Boyd and save Dore for something else. Especially maybe if if it's luck in the eight player state championship game on Saturday, 
they may want to avoid using Dore because that's probably where it'll be if Luck plays. Mm-hmm. If Luck makes it through to play Gilman or Newman. I gotcha. So they may say, all right, let's not play at Dore. Let's move it to Stanley Boyd just so that we don't have to double up Dore Field for those two games. They did it, they did it two years ago mm-hmm. when Abbott's, was Abbotsford Regis at Dore on a Friday night, and then it was Newman Luck on a Saturday for eight player. Yeah, but, 2019, right? Yep. Yeah. Those are fun times. Those were very fun times. <laughs> All right. So now um, looking at Friday, where's on focus going to be pointing cameras at? Well, we'll be in Colby. We'll be there. We'll have you guys on the call. Colby, Auburndale. Always nice to see you guys in the oh, yeah. team booth. Yep. So we'll be up there for that one. And then I'm going to Stanley for the a state semifinal and eight player. In the, Stanley Boyd? In Stanley Boyd. The number one ranked team. Gilman, the number one ranked Gilman Pirates versus the number two ranked Newman Cardinals. Whoa! Two teams, both undefeated. Both have put up massive offensive numbers, very good defenses. It is going to be a crazy game. So what is the average scoring amounts on those eight man? Because I, you've told me this yeah. before, but like just to share with everybody at home, like what's, what's a typical scoring amount? It's like arena football, it's, isn't it? It's closer to arena football. Um, it's actually very, like... Like players on the field is very similar to arena football. Field's a little bit narrower, but it's still when I mean, you only have eight players on the field, there's a lot of offense. Well, I was gonna say it's it's a there's a lot of space. There's a there's a to, lot to get sprung yeah. loose. There's yeah. a lot of space to get sprung loose. Um, it's nothing to see a team put seventy up in an eight player game and put up like seventy to thirty five. Unbelievable. Um, we saw one game come across. I mean, and the stats are what really will be mind boggling an eight player. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we had a t- we had a two teams combined for one thousand forty seven yards rushing in one game. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we had one team. It was um, Alma Center versus Phillips. Was Alma Center threw for five hundred and seventy five yards. Phillips ran for six hundred and twenty yards. It was seventy seven sixty three. Man, how is that to announce that game? Do the play by play. It's a lot of screaming touchdown. Yeah, I was going to say. Um, but no, I mean, there are two teams that also play good defense, though, so I don't think it'll be quite that high scoring. But it should be a good game. Uh, you know, it's a state semifinal. A player runs only runs 16 team playoffs, so they get they wrap up a week early. Interesting. But yeah, no, that'll be a really good game on Friday night in Stanley. Well, fantastic. And that's going to be this... This Friday. This Friday. At 7? Yep, both games are at 7. Okay, fantastic. So, yep, we'll have the Colby Auburndale game. That'll be you and Wade. Woo! On the call for that one. And then, yep, Matt, the other Matt and I will be up in. The other Matt, yeah. The other Matt and I will be up We'd in Stanley. We'd love to call him that. <laughs> <laughs> yep, the other Matt and I will be up in Stanley for Newman Gilman. So, both should be great games. Oh, fantastic. Well, is there anything else you'd like to get plugged into here? I mean, I, it's your show. <laughs> I think we're good. Um, I'm excited to see. I'm gonna, I know I'm going to have that Colby Auburndale game on my phone. Keeping an eye on that one, so we'll give you some shout outs over <laughs> over the system. But yeah, I mean, speaking as a homer, this is, it'll be fantastic. Like uh, it's been a while since Colby has gotten to level three playoffs. You know, it's it's nothing unusual like the last couple of years that we got to level two, but to get to level three, this is going to be a big deal, and to, especially to have it at home. Yeah. One last chance to see this special group of seniors that we haven't had in a while since the past championship games, yeah. like your 2010, your 08, and your 98 squads, and I think that's going to be a big that's going to be a big thing, especially for that crowd. So like, it's going to be a big night. Oh yeah, and it's for sure the last home game. I mean, this is for sure, absolutely the last home game. For yeah, Colby. that's they're they're not coming back to that field, nope. and that's yeah, I, it's gonna be. I don't think there's gonna be one dry eye in that in that nope. house or in that house in that stadium. Nope, not at all. Yeah. So all right, but all right, cool. But yeah, so um, that game's on Friday. Colby versus Auburndale. Will Auburndale be the upset party in Chi Town, or is Colby gonna advance to level four? Either way, this is gonna be a special game. You don't want to miss it. So thank you very much to On Focus and the upcoming sponsor that we'll be announcing that made that game happen. But, you know, you guys do amazing work um, making these games um, available for people who cannot make it to these games, whether it's geographic or physical. And they're just so appreciative that they're able to bring the enjoyment and excitement of these games, whether it's their fan base or it's their grandkids or kids that um, that are playing, and they're able to watch that. So it's just fantastic what you guys are doing. Oh, and it's a lot of fun. I mean, 
I can never complain. I'm getting paid to watch football. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thanks everybody. Take care, Steve. Thanks a lot. And, uh, we'll wait till, 